But what I'll be doing today is looking at the issue of miracles in regard to the kingdom. And I think that's an important thing to do because I don't think you can have a proper, full understanding of the issue of miracles or signs and wonders unless you're uh, look, seeing how those things relate to the kingdom of God, which I would personally hold as being uh, the primary theme of scripture from Genesis 1 through uh, Revelation 22. Uh, miracles do not occur in a vacuum. They must be understood within other great themes and the kingdom being one of them. As I say that, I think it's important to understand that modern promoters of the signs and wonders movement, they're also very intentional in linking their view of signs and wonders with, with the kingdom of God. So it's not just uh, we who will be looking at that issue, but they have made statements as well. For example, John Wimber, uh, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, also known as the Signs and Wonders Movement, he was very explicit about link linking his view of signs and wonders with the kingdom. As a matter of fact, he explicitly uh, in books said that he adopted George Eldon Ladd's already not yet views of the kingdom as the basis for his particular views on power evangelism and signs and wonders. George Ladd, if you're familiar with his teaching, taught that the Davidic messianic kingdom is in operation today, that it has been inaugurated and that the Davidic kingdom is in force. And thus for John Wimber, if the Davidic kingdom, if Jesus is in operation now, then the miracles associated with that kingdom should also be occurring. I wanted to give you a quote. This is from the 1986 book, Power Evangelism, which was updated in 2009. And in it, the now late John Wimber wrote, quote, I was already acquainted with George Eldon Ladd's writings. He was a fuller theological seminary professor, but it was not until I read his book, Jesus in the Kingdom, that I realized his work on the kingdom formed, now listen to this, formed a theological basis for power evangelism. As I read Dr. Ladd's books and read afresh the gospel accounts, I became convinced that power evangelism was for today. So the thing that you should note from that quote is that the founder of the modern signs and wonders movement is explicitly linking his views on signs and wonders with a specific view of the kingdom. And in this particular case, the Davidic kingdom, his view that the Davidic kingdom is inaugurated for today. In that particular book, the authors, of, of which there's another man who writes with John Wimber, they actually, as they're explaining their power evangelism approach, they devote part one, which consists of five chapters, to the topic of the kingdom of God. Again, really emphasizing that that is the theological basis for what they're promoting. Uh, one analyzer of the Signs and Wonders movement in a journal article wrote, it, wrote and this is a quote, in the signs and wonders movement, the existence of the miraculous gifts is directly linked to the kingdom of God on earth. The movement has capitalized on a certain view of God's kingdom that provides the theological undergirding for the practice of signs and wonders, end quote. Thus, it cannot be emphasized too much that a theology of signs and wonders and miracles, and I'll be using those fairly interchangeably, involve a specific theology of the kingdom of God. So a proper understanding is gonna, of the kingdom is going to help us hopefully come to correct views on the purpose of signs and wonders. So, and I, I think you can make that correlation. Now, if a person has a proper understanding of the kingdom, it should help understand properly the role of signs and wonders in the Bible. But look at it from the opposite way, too. If a person has a faulty view of the kingdom, that can actually lead to faulty views of when it comes to the purpose of signs and wonders and miracles. So often when I find myself disagreeing with those that have different views of signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Spirit, I often find myself disagreeing at a very basic level, which is in regard to their views on the kingdom. Now we're going to look at several details today, but let me give you up front <clears throat> what my main argument is. And we're going to be looking at a lot of trees in the forest. I kind of want to give you the forest up front. And let me just tell you what I'm going to be arguing here. I'm going to be arguing that signs and wonders occur in very rare and strategic times in history where the nearness of the kingdom of God on earth <clears throat> is being presented in close connection with Israel. These presentations are associated with very unique representatives of God. Moses, Elijah, Jesus, the apostles, and the two representatives in the book of Revelation. This present age we live in is not characterized by signs and wonders. 
We are not in the Davidic messianic reign of Jesus or the tribulation period, period that immediately precedes the kingdom. Continual signs and wonders, therefore, are not part of God's plans for this age. Now, as I make this claim, I do want to make a couple clarifications. I do believe that there are kingdom implications for this present age. Jesus, the ultimate son of David, has arrived. He came with his first coming. We also know that in fulfillment of Psalm 110, that he has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. We also know that messianic salvation is happening for all who believe in King Jesus. And we today who are followers of his follow his commands and the law of Christ. So there are kingdom implications for this age, but I do not believe that the Bible teaches that we are currently in the Davidic messianic millennial reign of Jesus and that the miracles that occur with such a reign are not occurring in this age. When Jesus returns, the millennial kingdom will bring those kingdom conditions. There will be a binding of Satan. There will be healing of diseases. There will be a resurrection of the dead, but those await the future and are not happening on a wide scale today. I also want to make one other point of clarification as we talk about the relationship of signs and wonders to this particular age where the issue at hand is not whether God has done or can do miracles. I think all of us know that he is a God of miracles and that he has the ability to do those. But we are addressing here is the specific claim of some who are saying that signs and wonders should be characterizing uh, the church's ministry in this particular age based on a certain view of the kingdom. That's what we're dealing with. So what are signs and wonders? As we begin this study, let me start with, with some clarifications. First, when we're referring to the biblical miracles and the biblical signs and wonders, we're speaking of directly supernatural occurrences. We're talking about events that cannot be explained by natural processes or natural laws, things that are directly uh, supernatural and have no human explanation. Miracles are often referred to as signs and wonders in the Bible. Signs point to things, and that's going to be really key to our understanding of signs and wonders, is understanding is that they point to certain things. And I think we'll see that there's a strong pointing to the issue of the kingdom of God on earth. The majority of miracles and signs and wonders in the Bible are so powerful that even the enemies of God cannot deny that they have happened. And I think that's an important understanding for us to have. When we're looking at the biblical pattern of signs and miracles, they were public, they were instant, they were undeniable. And one thing that I see over and over again as I look at the clusters of signs and wonders in the Bible is that even the enemies of God had to admit that something has happened. When God performed miracles at the Exodus, we know that Pharaoh and the Egyptians sure know what was going on. If you were able to talk to them back then, there would have been no doubt that they knew that they were experiencing the signs and wonders. And as a matter of fact, even though they were resistant to those things, it eventually led to Pharaoh letting the people go. Also, when Jesus did his miracles, they were public and instant and undeniable. He did them for everyone to see. In John chapter 11, verse 47, it says that when the chief priests and the Pharisees were convening a council about him, they said, quote, what are we doing for this man is performing many signs? In the book of Acts, before many people in Jerusalem, the apostles declared in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Just think about that. The apostles going before the leaders of Israel and the people and the same people that had, cried, had called out to crucify Christ, the apostles can tell them, you know that he did these miracles. When the apostles themselves perform miracles in Jerusalem, in the realm of hostile people and religious leaders, no one denied that a miracle had occurred. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 4, if you were to, I'm not going to read the whole section of verses 5 through 16, but it talks about the elders and the scribes and, and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and various of the religious leaders. They get together to deal with what the apostles have been doing because they have been performing miracles. And it says in verse 16 of Acts chapter 4, for the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. Again, another statement from the enemies of God at this particular point that miracles have occurred and they cannot be denied. 
Uh, in the future tribulation period, in Revelation chapter 11, there's a ministry of two witnesses who are doing very powerful signs and wonders as they're unique representatives of God. They do miracles like those of Moses and Elijah. And although we don't know this, some speculate that perhaps it may even be Moses and Elijah who are the two witnesses of Revelation. But they're doing such incredible miracles that all the world knows it. As a matter of fact, when they're killed for a short period of time, the people throw a party, a worldwide party, because their tormentors appear to have been killed, although we know that they're going to be resurrected shortly. So when you look at that, when you look at the time of Moses, and when you look at the time of Christ and the apostles, and then what will be coming with the two witnesses of Revelation, we see, again see that criteria, public, instant, undeniable miracles, even the enemies of God had to acknowledge it. And I think that criteria is important. Because I, I think throughout this whole series, when we're talking about things like signs and wonders and miracles and prophecies and, and, and tongues and all those sorts of things, one of the things we have to do is look at the biblical pattern. What were those things in the Bible? It's not going to be enough for people to just come along now and say, these things are for today or we're doing those things. One of the criteria is that the biblical pattern would need to be met. And if someone is not meeting that criteria, we have a right to be skeptical. I'm not saying that's the only argument, but that's one of the things that we have to have to look at because I think many people today are claiming certain things, but it is not in line with what the biblical pattern. I don't see any evidence that the types of signs and wonders that are described in the Bible have been occurring in the church after the ministry of the apostles and certainly not after AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. Another thing that I want to mention is that signs and wonders occur at strategic times in biblical history for very unique circumstances. And so when you look at the, the signs and wonders, they appear to come in clusters. And as they come, they are, they are performed or done through very unique and select representatives of God. And even when they're occurring at certain very unique periods in history, they don't appear to be normative for all of God's people. The first major cluster of miracles and signs and wonders was found at the time of the Exodus from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. As a matter of fact, I was reading one dictionary of theology that said there's about 18 references to signs and wonders in the Old Testament and, and 13 or 14 of them explicitly refer back to the time of the Exodus. There's another cl cluster of miracles that occurs during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha during the ninth century BC. The next major cluster of miracles occurs quite a bit later with the time of Jesus when he's doing his miracles. This is followed by the post-Pentecost ministry of the apostles who also perform signs and wonders, many of them being very public in Jerusalem in front of the Jewish people and the religious leaders of Israel. And then of course, the last cluster of miracles is found in Revelation chapter 11 with the two witnesses of Revelation where they perform miracles of judgment for 1260 days in Jerusalem. I think another thing that we have to understand is also that the presence of signs and wonders comes within the context of the nearness of the kingdom of God on earth. And at this particular point, this is where, going to be, where most of my focus is going to be as we directly deal with the issue of the relationship of signs and wonders to the kingdom of God on earth. In other words, when signs and wonders occur in clusters, there are strong kingdom implications in regard to the presence of the kingdom on earth. This was true of the time of Moses and the Exodus. The miracles performed at that time served several functions. And again, I'm not here to claim that miracles only have specific reference to the kingdom because there are going to be other purposes. But I am also going to argue that it ends up being one of their major purposes. When you look back at the miracles of the Exodus, they definitely validated and showed that Moses was a man of God. They were, the miracles of the, at the time of the Exodus were also judgments against Pharaoh, against Egypt, against the gods of Egypt. The miracles and signs and wonders that were being performed were also acts of mercy for the Hebrew people. God, as he looked upon his people in difficult situation, he wanted to give them relief and show them mercy. There's no doubt, too, that the miracles were also associated with the, with the giving of revelation because, because the Mosaic law was going to be given at that particular time. So there are various purposes for the miracles, but it is also true that the miracles of that time were also directly related to a kingdom purpose. And that had to do with God's kingdom purpose to set up 
a kingdom on the earth with Israel as fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham that a great nation would come from him and that this nation would be given a promised land and that they would be the platform of blessings for all the nations of the earth. The Exodus occurred so that God's kingdom program with Israel could begin. The Abrahamic covenant could not be fulfilled if the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, stayed forever enslaved in Egypt. That could not be the case. There needed to be a deliverance. The signs and wonders are gonna be directly involved with the deliverance of those people in order that they can become a kingdom and a nation before God. In that regard, I think Exodus chapter 19, verse six is very, very important because as they've been delivered, the people have been delivered miraculously from Egypt in many ways. We find out the purpose for why God has delivered them. They are brought to Mount Sinai. They are about to receive God's law, which functions as their national constitution. And this is what God says in Exodus 19, six. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the purpose. That's what they are to be. They are to be a kingdom. And as Israel receives its constitution, its Mosaic law, and as they will eventually soon be getting the land, those are going to be the ingredients for the kingdom of God, the mediatorial kingdom that is established on earth at that time. So God's kingdom program involves the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and Abraham's people becoming a part of that kingdom. And notice also that that is done through the very unique representative of Moses. The signs and wonders of this time were performed through Moses and they occurred in connection with God's chosen people and then becoming a nation. Now there would be miracles done after Moses. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you read the conquest of the land and there are miracles that are done, but there's even statements in scripture indicating that there was no one like Moses that did the miracles that he did. There was something very special about that time. As we move along in time, around the ninth century BC, there's there's another cluster of miracles that occurred with Elijah and Elisha. The miracles that they did testified to their credentials as prophets and served as warnings to the rebellious Northern Kingdom. One of the things that takes place is they're dealing with the whole issue of Baal worship and the depravity that's taking place in the nation. Their miracles are in the context as warnings and signs to a people that God is the true God and that they should reject false worship. Then there's another cluster of miracles that will be done after that. Several centuries go by and Jesus the Messiah comes and he comes explicitly proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom to Israel. As a matter of fact, a summary statement of Jesus's message is found in Matthew chapter four, verse 17, where we're told that he came from that time saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this was immediately followed by a healing ministry in Israel. The kingdom is presented as at hand. That's a summary statement of his message. And then if you were to read Matthew chapter four, verses 23 to 24, it describes his ministry accompanied by miracles. Matthew 4, 23 says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So it's very significant, kingdom message, followed by miracles. If you were to read all of Matthew chapter eight and chapter nine, it's all about miracles. And then Matthew chapter nine, verse 35, gives a summary statement of Jesus's message. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. I was reading B.B. Warfield had made a statement about these miracles at this particular time. And he was saying that disease probably was wiped out from the whole area of Capernaum and the surrounding areas. His healing ministry was so extensive. According to Matthew chapter nine, verse 33, the crowds declared nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel because it is so astounding what is taking place. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus delegates the task of the kingdom proclamation to Israel. In Matthew chapter 10, verse one, we're told that Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority over 
unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And then what we're told after that in verses five to eight is also strategic. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Several things are noteworthy from this section in Matthew chapter 10. First, Jesus' incredible ability to perform miracles is delegated to the 12. Second, the message at this time was specifically for the people of Israel. They're told not to go to the Gentiles, not to go to the Samaritans, but to focus on the lost sheep of Israel. Third, the performing of the miracles is associated with the nearness of the kingdom. They're doing miracles. And also, fourth point, the kingdom was near or at hand. There's some disagreement on what at hand means. Some take that it means arrived. I think the scholarship and the study of that is better to understand it, that the kingdom was on the brink, that it was impending. Something very special is taking place, and this is not a normative situation. Later in Matthew 28, later with the Great Commission, we'll see that the command is for the disciples to take the gospel to the whole entire world. But at this particular point in Matthew 10 at this time, it's a message to Israel accompanied by miracles. Then in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, one of the most important statements in scripture regarding miracles in the kingdom. Actually, I'm going to read verses 22 to 23 and then verse 28. But you have a situation in Matthew 12 where a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and Jesus healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? Notice they're, and at this particular point, they're making a good connection. Now we know from Matthew 11 that the cities of Israel were rejecting Christ. You can read that in verses 20 to 24. But at this particular point, they see a miracle and they say, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? They raise that question and actually it's a very good question. Because passages like Isaiah chapter 35 predicted that when the kingdom conditions would come, it would involve the healing of people and the lame leaping like a deer and blind men seeing and those who cannot hear being able to hear. And of course, if you're familiar with the account, you know what the religious leaders do. They end up uh, rejecting and saying that he's doing his miracles in the power of the devil. But Jesus makes an interesting statement in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. He says, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So there you have that very direct link between the miracles and the kingdom of God. Jesus says his miracles point to something and they point to the kingdom. The kingdom had not actually arrived at this particular point. Jesus had not been crucified yet or resurrected or ascended. The day of the Lord had not occurred yet, but there was a real presence of the kingdom as Jesus' person and work were before the people. Each miracle that Jesus did was a sample and a foretaste and a glimpse of kingdom conditions when the restoration of all things would occur. When Jesus was standing in their midst of their people and doing undeniable signs and wonders, there was a sense in which the kingdom had come upon the people and they should be compelled to repent and come to him in faith. As I mentioned before, when the miracles were done, they were actually glimpses of the kingdom and things talked about. As I mentioned in the Isaiah 35 passage, I'll actually go ahead and read that. It says in Isaiah 35, 5, then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped and the lame will leap like a deer. In Isaiah chapter 25, verses six to eight, it talks about in the kingdom conditions in the, in the kingdom banquet, that there's gonna be resurrection that takes place. Interestingly, in Matthew chapter 11, when John the Baptist was in prison, he wanted confirmation that Jesus really was the one. And so his disciples come to Jesus and they, they ask that question. And Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 11, verses two to five, with references back to Isaiah 35. It says, while John was in prison, he heard of the works of Christ. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one? And this, this is what Jesus said in verse four. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So he brings up Isaiah 35 as proof 
that his miracles are authenticating who he is. So in sum, the main point that we're making here is that Jesus's miracles were within a heavy kingdom context. Every time Jesus did a miracle of healing, it was a glimpse of worldwide healing that will take place on a global scale when he comes again. When Jesus raised the dead, this was a glimpse of the coming resurrection of the dead that will take place. Whenever Jesus cast out a demon or dealt with the powers of Satan, it was a glimpse of the final removal of Satan that will be taking place in the future and what's talked about in Revelation chapter 20. Whenever Jesus showed mastery over nature, whether walking on water or controlling animals or donkeys to do what he wanted, it was a glimpse of coming harmony over nature. If you would read Isaiah chapter 11, it talks about that when the kingdom comes, that impacts nature, it impacts animals. All those things, healings, resurrections, exorcism, mastery over nature and animals, all those things were talked about and predicted in the Old Testament, and he is presenting those things. Many scholars have noted, though, that the focus of Jesus' ministry changed after the events of Matthew chapter 12. That's where you have that famous blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, where the religious leaders say Jesus is not doing his work in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's doing it in the power of the devil. Up till that point, Jesus and the 12 had been doing widespread proclamation of the gospel to all the cities of Israel. But things begin to change at that point. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins to speak in parables. And his disciples notice something's different. And they, come and, say, what? and they say, why are you speaking in parables? And he says, I'm going to be hiding information now from those who won't hear and giving new information to those who will. After that time, Jesus obviously will have contact with people, but it seems like the widespread proclamation of the nearness of the kingdom, the cities of Israel, is going to give way to preparation for the cross. As a matter of fact, I would draw your attention to two verses that I think are very significant because they're, they're time indicators of what Jesus is doing. In Matthew 4.17, a verse that we just looked at, it says, from that time, and I want you to notice, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When you get to Matthew 16, 21, we see another from that time, but this time we see from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. In Matthew 4, 17, we're told the emphasis of his ministry is on the nearness of the kingdom. In Matthew 16, 21, it's on preparation for the cross. So that tells you what the emphasis is there. Moving on, we've talked about the time of the Exodus. Well, we've talked about Elijah and Elisha. We've talked about the ministry of Jesus. Now we're going to talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which itself was a unique miracle. But from this time, what we see from Acts chapter 2, we're going to see a lot of miracles that are done by the apostles. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 3, there's the healing of a lame man that's done in the presence of all. The apostles are very in the very near vicinity of the temple, and there's lots of people around. And in, in this healing that takes place of the lame man allows Peter an opportunity in chapter 3, verse 12, to address the men of Israel. So he begins to address them in light of this miracle. And in Acts chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, he uses this miracle as an opportunity to call on the people to repent and to believe in Jesus the Messiah. And it also discusses the second coming in the kingdom. Very important passage. Starting in Acts chapter 3, verse 18, Peter says, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So in that sense, the suffering promises have come to pass. Now notice what he says in verse 19. Therefore, repent and return. In other words, get saved, stop your rebellion, repent and return. That's a call to salvation. Notice that there's another indicator here. So that your sins may be wiped away. If you repent and return, there will be salvation. You will be forgiven of your sins. But now this, there's something else that's going to happen. In order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's a reference to kingdom conditions. He also talks about the second coming in verse 20, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. And then he talks about kingdom conditions again in verse 21, whom heaven must receive 
until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So there it talks about the restoration of all things. And it says that heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things. I actually think that's an allusion back to Psalm 110.1, which was talked a lot about in Acts chapter two. Uh, David's Lord, the Messiah has to have a session at the right hand of the father, Psalm 110.1, until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet as he rules from Zion, according to Psalm 110.2. So, but what we see here in Acts chapter three is an undeniable miracle leads to a message from Peter to Israel. He preaches that repentance leads to forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins leads to kingdom conditions and the return of Jesus Christ. The miracles that the apostles do are incredible. We we don't have time to go through all the details, but I would draw your attention to Acts chapter five, verses 12 to 16, because there's a, as they're doing their miracles, there's incredible things going on. It says in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16, that at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. So notice that, many signs and wonders. Moving on to verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. And then notice verse 15, because this appears almost, almost very reminiscent to what Jesus was doing in his ministry, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And also people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So you're just having these mass healings that are taking place at this particular time. But notice several things from this passage in Acts. First, the signs and wonders were being done at the hands of the apostles in Jerusalem, not by all the Christians as a whole. It was being done through them. Second, like miracles at the Exodus and at the ministry of Jesus, the signs and the wonders of the apostles, they were public and they were instantaneous and they were being seen by everybody. Third, the apostles offered healing The the people that they offered to were all being healed. That's what the end of verse 16 says. They were all being healed. Again, contrast that with a lot of uh, so-called ministries taking place today, healing ministries, where you don't see that. You don't see people out in the streets in the public eye with these healings where everybody is being healed. There was something very unique about this time period. And I also think, as I mentioned before, based on Acts 3, 18 to 21, that these miracles have a close connection with the message of the kingdom. Just as Jesus was preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We saw in Acts 3, 18 to 21, that the apostles were preaching kingdom conditions at this time as well. Next, the next big sign is this is future Signs and wonders will be performed by two very special representatives of God during the tribulation. And that's the two witnesses of Revelation. If you look in Revelation chapter 11, verses three to six, during this coming period, this uh, time that will test the whole entire earth, a time that is future from our standpoint. Verse three says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Verse five says, if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, then he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. These two men of God are God's witnesses for 1260 days, which is half of the seven year tribulation period. They have supernatural ability to destroy their enemies. And we're not told who they are, so we can't be dogmatic on that. It seems like what they're doing is very reminiscent to the sorts of miracles that both Moses and Elijah did. But these are obviously two very unique chosen men of God who are doing these things at that time. There's no indication that this is characteristic of all the believers of God during this time, but these two witnesses have special abilities. The other references to signs and wonders in this particular period, such as Matthew 24 at the Olivet Discourse and 2 Thessalonians 2, where it's talking about the future and things regarding the day of the Lord. It talks about false signs and wonders being done by those who are false teachers and agents of Satan. But in this particular time, the focus is on these two 
chosen individuals. Even their deaths are miraculous. They're killed, but three and a half days later, they're resurrected and then snatched up into heaven. I find it very significant that a few verses later in the same chapter, we're told in verse 15 that the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And then in verse 17, we give you, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Very close connection between these two special individuals chosen by God and the nearness of the kingdom. So that leads us to a very significant point as we look at those eras that we've just did. When we survey biblical history, including the future, it appears that clusters of miracles occur at the hands of unique servants of God during times when there are major implications for the kingdom of God on earth. What does that mean for our present age? I don't believe that this age we live in is one in which we have specific prophetic and apostolic representatives performing signs in connection with the nearness of the kingdom of God on earth. That will take place in the tribulation period, but it is not taking place today. The last cluster of miracles that we see in the Bible occurred before AD 70, which I think is very strategic because uh, Jesus promised in Luke 19 verses 41 to 44 that there would be a destruction of Jerusalem because the people had missed their day of visitation. He predicted that destruction to come. And so he predicted that and that occurred in AD 70. I think it's very significant that as even as AD 70 approaches, it seems that the miracles on the whole seem to, seem to wane. The last recorded miracle in the Bible occurred around AD 60 by Paul on the island of Malta. About three years later, Paul wrote Epaphroditus that he was sick to the point of death. Philippians 2.27. Around AD 67, Paul did not heal Timothy's stomach, but recommended a little wine for medicinal purposes, 1 Timothy 5.23. According to 2 Timothy 4.20, a short time after this, Paul left Trophimus sick at Miletus. I think those things are significant. The book of Hebrews gives us significant information concerning the strategic times of signs and wonders that were done by the hands of the apostles. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5, makes reference to the powers of the age to come. Here we're told that these first century readers had tasted something. They had tasted miracles and they're associated with the kingdom. Yet the writer of Hebrews links these miracles with the unique ministry of the apostles. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, and I'll just read verse 4, but verse four says that God also testifying with them. And we know that them is the apostles because they're the ones that heard the words of the Lord that's talked about right before this verse. So God testified with them, with the apostles. How did he do it? Both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. He links the signs and wonders with a specific group with the apostles, he does not indicate that signs and wonders are being done by all Christians at that time. So even in the first century, even at this particular time, there's the understanding that the signs and wonders were being done at the hands of the apostles. There's another issue that I want to briefly discuss here in the remaining time that we, and just in the few minutes that we have remaining. And this goes back to that point we were talking about earlier where there are some who are claiming that because we're in the Davidic reign, and some would even say the millennial reign of Jesus, that that must mean that the miracles of the Davidic kingdom are taking place. We saw that earlier with the founder of the Signs and Wonders movement where he linked his view of signs and wonders with an already Davidic reign. I was reading an author who was defending the Pentecostal charismatic view in the book, Our Miraculous Gifts for Today. That's one of those Zondervan Counterpoint series book the author who was defending the charismatic Pentecostal view has a specific section linked to the Davidic kingdom. And he argues that we're in the Davidic messianic reign today. And he says, quote, our purpose is to apply this principle to the continuity of the miraculous gifts. He also goes on to say that the anointed Davidite, Jesus, passes on his own anointing to those who come under his reign. 
very significant there is that he's linking the Davidic reign with miracles. I would just say this. I believe that the Bible teaches, according to from Psalm 110 and Acts chapter 2, that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. He has been exalted to the right hand of the Father in fulfillment of Psalm 110.1, but Psalm 110.2 says there's a day coming where he is going to reign from Zion. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. I would just draw your attention to a few verses. In Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and you're getting, you know, this is very close to the end of Jesus's ministry. Luke 19, 11 states that while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he gives them this parable of the Minas through verse 27 to indicate that he must go away first. And then when he comes again, that he will rule, he will reward his subjects and judge his enemies. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus tells you when he's going to assume the Davidic throne. Matthew 19, 28 says, and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, which appears to be the cosmic renewal associated with the end times, those of you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, note that, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What's significant there is Jesus' sitting or coming upon his glorious throne, his Davidic throne, is linked with two things. The regeneration, which is the restoration of the cosmos, and the apostles ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. I take it that those events are linked with the second coming. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus is giving events associated with the tribulation period and is coming again. And he says in Matthew 25, 31, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. You see that connection? What's the sitting on his glorious Davidic throne linked with? It's linked with the son of man coming in his glory and all the angels with him. Those are future events. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus predicts events in the coming tribulation period. That's Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus is describing all these things and including cosmic signs. And then Jesus, who again is very close to his death, he's, he's projecting out, talking about this period that is to come in the future. And he says, so you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. And he uses the same term there that he did early in his ministry. But you see, at this particular point, he's talking about the nearness of the Davidic kingdom in the future. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, one of the future rewards to the church is this. Jesus says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is currently at the right hand of the father, sharing the throne of deity. He talks about when he comes again that he's going to sit on his throne and those who are his followers will sit on his throne as well. So on multiple occasions, Jesus places his sitting on the throne of David as in the future and in connection with the second coming to earth. And thus I would say that this greatly challenges the claim that we must expect signs and wonders of the Davidic kingdom today because the Davidic kingdom is in operation. Christ is sharing the throne of deity at the Father. He has authority over all things, but the Davidic reign will take place specifically with his second coming. So as we wrap things up here, again, I would just say that I think there's two main things to look at, and there are things that I mentioned on the chart, which would be is that when you look at signs and wonders and miracles in the Bible, you see that they happen at very strategic points in history with very unique men. At the time of the Exodus with Moses, you see things going on at the end of the mediatorial kingdom with warnings coming from Elijah and Elisha. You see miracles associated with the nearness of the kingdom in the ministry of Jesus. You see miracles associated with the presentation of the kingdom in Acts chapter 3. And it will be seen again in Revelation chapter 11 when the two witnesses are doing those miracles. When I look at this age that we live in, I don't see this as being a time where we have apostolic prophetic representatives proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom of God on earth. I think that for very special times and is, and is not occurring today. And also on that last point, I think when we look at the Davidic kingdom, we see that the emphasis in the scripture is on the futurity of the Davidic reign. 
And so those would be evidences that this present age is not a times of signs and wonders. And this, those who are claiming that we must have a theology of signs and wonders based on a theology of the kingdom, including uh, the fact that we're, or the belief that we're in the Davidic reign is not biblically accurate. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just uh, thank you for your word as we discuss difficult matters and matters that are controversial. We want to come and study what your word has to say about your kingdom so that it shines insight on what you're doing. We want to line up with your purposes. And Lord, we want to stay true to what your word says and to uh, not fall uh, for things that would not be accurate. So we ask your guidance in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.